I mean, it was something. Um, it was one of those worship services where it just was like you're just immersed in the presence of God. It was just amazing. And I feel like the worship team just did a fantastic job with that. So thank you guys for that. I was um, contemplating this morning about all the people we have serving here, um, the worship team among those, volunteers that we have. I was thinking about how blessed we are as a body to have the people ministering in a way that they are here. And um, I want you all to know I'm praying for you. I'm thankful for you, each and every one of you that serve. It's, um, it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing to share the word of God with the children, to share worship with the congregation. Um, it's a blessing for me to, to be able to share with you today and every time I've been able to. Um, so well, I'm, I'm going to get into this, this sermon. And as I, as I begin to think about this next part um, of, of my attempt at crafting a series, which is what I'm calling the trust series. Um, I'm thinking about a day today, and this is on the, the next slide. I'm thinking about today in a time when skepticism abounds in our culture. And, and many things, today I'm going to focus on just a few points of skepticism that are still fairly prominent um, and popular, specific to Jesus. And for that reason, this, this uh, part of the trust series is called Trusting in Christ. And for those of us that know Jesus, of course, we trust in him. And some of the questions I'm going to ask today or the, the arguments I'm going to highlight today might seem silly to those of us that trust him when you've had that work of the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, um, that work of salvation, we, we know that Jesus is real and that he definitely did exist. And yet, these questions I want to address today to be able to help your faith. Last week, we talked about um, the word of God, and we talked about some of the supporting arguments and evidences for its um, reliability as a document, but when you trust in Christ and, you've, and God's worked in you, you, you trust in the Word. And so this, is, this uh, sermon today is not to convince you of how real Jesus is. If you're a believer, you know this. However, this is meant to equip you. It's my belief that if we trust in Christ, we must share Christ. It's kind of the idea that if you had the cure for cancer, you know, if you had it today, you discovered it, you would probably want to share it with the world, would you not? You would think, I've got this amazing medical intervention that I can do that's going to save countless thousands, if not millions of lives, um, thinking of over time. But we have in Christ the answer for sin. We have the answer for the sin problem in this world that we can share and so the idea is that when we come to Christ, that we share that with others. I want to help your faith today in that when you are sharing Christ, that you will be equipped to understand some of these questions and be able to respond to those. Maybe I need to step back. I feel like I'm feeding back a little bit. Maybe this, is pro this probably sounds better, right? And so that you can have an answer. So apologia or apologetics is the study of being able to give an answer. As I spoke about at the end of the message last week, being able to give an answer is not going to equip you to save anybody. The Holy Spirit does that work of convincing of sin. And Jesus' blood provides the remission of sin. But what you can do is you have some of these answers for your faith. You can bolster your own confidence to share the word in the face of criticism and skepticism. And you can also be ready to have a discussion. And so the worst thing that you could do with what, I'm gonna sh what I've shared with you last week, what I'm going to share with you today, is to take that and to throw it in the face of somebody and to argue with them and try to win a debate. The best thing you could do with this is, first, study it for yourself. Build your confidence in sharing the gospel. The second best thing you can do 
is to never use this information to fight with somebody is to use this information to foster a discussion. I have never seen in my whole time, and I've had many discussions with people that were skeptics or um, just not, um, not yet believers, I have yet to see one time when I have made the mistake of arguing with somebody about these points where that turned out to be anything but a disaster. And so please, understand I'm not equipping you to fight, I'm equipping you to minister, to evangelize, to share your faith, okay? So let's, um, let's pray together really quick, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the Word. Lord God, we are so thankful for, for Jesus and for this faith. We're so thankful that we can be here today to sing these songs, to worship you, because you are so worthy. Only help us today to think on your Word and to think on these things and help us to be doers of the word today and help us to share our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So our scripture um, in, in your notes is, by the way, I've got my notes on here, so I'm not on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook or anything like that, but um, I have my notes on here. So the scripture for today is John 14, 1 through 7. So we'll read it. Um, all the scriptures I have listed are uh, the ESV. I think I forgot to put that on one of the slides, so just in case you're wondering what version it is, um, if there's one that's missed, um, it's ESV. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So this is Jesus speaking. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Amen. So this comes to one of the first arguments that people will make. So Jesus made a statement there. Jesus made a bold statement saying that if you've seen me, you've seen God. This was problematic for the religious leaders of that time. He made a declaration to them that was absolute blasphemy. End of story for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and any of the religious authorities. And so, it's common, it's common for people to state they believe that Jesus existed, but typically what you're going to hear people say about Jesus is, especially in academia, he was just a great teacher. He was, he was a really good person. He did really good things. He's a, he's a standard of like a good life to, to live by. I'm going to the next slide. Thank you. But we can see in John there, the, the scripture we just read, these, this can't be true. These two things can't be true at the same time. What we just read in John and the idea that he's just a good teacher, uh, can't, can't, th those two statements can't be together. In, it's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Because what Jesus is saying is, I am God. I am one with God. And if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And so the happy Jesus, um, this is, a, this is a, 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 a personal statement that I'm making here. Our culture oftentimes make, makes Jesus out to be this happy figure. Um, you'll see like the bobblehead Jesus, you know, and, and these representations of Christ as this, you know, again, again, kind of speaking to the ethic of this good teacher. I had a, a professor in Bible college. His name was Dr. Richard Hanner. He was so influential that we would literally, if, if people really took after his teaching, they were called Hannerites. I mean, he was an incredibly influential teacher in the Dallas metro area. Sarah, I think you must have had him. Um, and Dr. Richard Hanner could not he could not stand 
the idea of, of just Jesus sort of being this good person, this good teacher, and that was it. And so he would stand up on stage and he would say, he would say, they believe in the, the good fake Jesus. He would, he would like literally do this, like, this, like walk like an Egyptian stance. Um, and that's, and that's where that, that statement, the happy Jesus comes from, the good guy. He's just a good teacher. However, this is problematic because what we see in Scripture is very different. Going on to the next slide is that in several places in Scripture, so I'm just going to give, give you guys these examples you can see. You don't have to remember all these points. Is Jesus made several claims that make that type of an idea problematic. So when you, hear, when you may be sharing your faith, so, uh, it's common for people to say, well, I mean, I like Jesus. You know, he was like a good teacher, right? Like he was a good person. He's like a good example to follow, but it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like it's the absolute truth. However, Jesus made these statements. In John 8, 46, Jesus claimed to be perfectly sinless. In John 8, 19, Jesus claims to know, uh, to know, to know him is to know God, kind of like what we also read in our, in our opening scripture. John 12, 45, Jesus claims to see him as to see God, and, and so on. And in fact, in John 10, 29 through 33, Jesus claims, I and the Father are one. In the next scriptures, 8, 20, uh, John 8, 24, Jesus states, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And Jesus states in um, John 8, 58, that before Abraham was, I am. And so the Jews believed that Abraham, I mean, their view was of Abraham is literally the father of their whole nation. And Jesus is saying, before he was, I am. So readily, right after Jesus made that statement, they wanted to stone him right away. And I, th- I think that might have been the beginning of where, where they were actively going to try to end his life. And, and Mark 14, 62, which I won't, I won't read. You've seen that. So let's, let's move on to thinking about what... What are some, what is a, a, a logical statement that we can make or a way that we can talk about this topic with people to help them understand why this, this type of viewpoint is problematic? So looking at C.S. Lewis, um, who is an author of many books, um, if you haven't ever read The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I would really recommend it. It's a really easy read, very short. It's, it's definitely eye-opening. It's also sort of entertaining. But Mere Christianity is a major book that he wrote that I think, while I'm sure that there are, we, we may not all necessarily agree with everything that C.S. Lewis said, he makes a very powerful argument to address this issue. So C.S. Lewis, if you don't know him, he was an academic. He was also a member, um, a lot of people don't know this, of um, Fellowship of the British Academy, which is a great distinction, and he still is today. Uh, a legacy member anyway. He's obviously passed away. But he was an influential Christian writer in the, in the mid to, or early to mid-1900s. And Lewis posed an important question, or at least an important logical, uh, a logical exercise to think about Jesus' identity. And C.S. Lewis posited this. Based on Scripture, the only way that you can logically consider Jesus' identity is that he was either a total liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And here's why. Because of the bold statements that Jesus made about himself that I've uh, I've just given to you, just in the book of John, someone making these types of statements cannot just be a moral teacher. If Jesus was just a moral teacher, he would have spoken only in platitudes. Jesus wouldn't have appealed to the Godhead and being joined to it. Jesus wouldn't have talked about himself being perfectly sinless. He wouldn't have said things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so a person like this cannot just be a moral teacher, uh, just a good teacher. We, We have to conclude, because of these arguments, because of uh, Jesus' uh, uh, writings, uh, such as in, in this, this next slide, he must be lying. Um, that's difficult to believe because he then fulfilled 300, over three, what's 300 prophecies about him in the Old Testament. 
So it's difficult to conclude that he's lying because this, the, these, um, and also we have uh, corroborating evidence, which we'll address later on, or he's delusional. So he's just making these, these claims, understanding that in this time of when Jesus was living, there were multiple individuals that would claim that they were the Messiah. This was not a sort of a totally unheard of thing in this time for, uh, to, to hear people doing this. And so is he delusional like these other people that were coming up and claiming that they're the Messiah? So highlighting, highlighting these facts, it makes it impossible for Jesus just to be a good teacher or just some kind of a moral a good moral person. So we have to conclu- you have to, uh, we have to give that, that logical argument to those individuals. Okay, if he's just a good teacher, we can cite these issues to be able to, to be able to help a person understand. And when you help a person see that, that, well, Jesus really couldn't just be a good teacher, could he? Because reasons. This opens up a conversation about who is Jesus. And if he's not just a good teacher, what, was, what must we conclude um, that he is, if he's also not just delusional or a liar, he must be Lord. The next argument that people make about Jesus is that um, Jesus may not have really even existed. So you may, in, in your attempts at evangelism, if you try to share your faith with someone, you may very well confront this argument that, well, are you really sure? I mean, Jesus may not have really existed, and there are a number of arguments that people will make with um, somewhat convincing evidence if you don't know um, historical fact. And so looking at, looking at some of the references that we see outside of the Bible to the existence of Jesus, there, there are very many. I'm only going to list a few. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll actually discuss uh, a few, just a few of these in, in more detail. Um, to, the, to the next slide, please. Oops. It's not going. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So you could see that uh, again, you don't have to remember all of these points, but we can see that there are n- numerous accounts during the time just after Jesus would have been crucified that were speaking about Jesus as historical fact. And in fact, what a lot of people don't know is the Quran, which is the, the major uh, text, a faith text of the, the Muslim religion, mentions Jesus at least 78 times that I can tell. And it doesn't discuss Jesus as, you know, like some kind of a platitude or an allegory. It talks about Jesus as a historical figure that lived and died here on earth. And so let's look at, let's look at some of these texts in, in detail. So Josephus discussed Jesus. He gave an account in one of his writings of, in the execution of James, one of the, I believe the brother, of, possibly the brother of Jesus. Um, yes, so here uh, the text reads, the brother of Jesus who was called the Christ. And this text from Josephus is generally acknowledged as being, as being genuine and reliable historically. And also, you might, you might wonder, well, you just said last week that like a lot of these texts were written, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before they, the newest copy we have. Um, I can't say that we can just directly question every single one of these documents, but some of these documents um, can be pretty reliable. And in this case, Josephus um, gave an account of Jesus talking about the, the, the killing of James um, as a martyr. Tacitus who was a renowned historian, gave an account of Christians. So this would have been during the time of Nero, who was uh, a ruler in Rome, and he, was, uh, he, he terrorized Christians and uh, murdered them by, the, by the masses. And so Christians were seen as criminals in, in that, in that, in that uh, Roman government. And so Tacitus wrote um, in the next slide, he writes, Christians who were hated for their abominable crimes, their name comes from Christ, who during the reign of Tiberius had been executed by the procurator Pontius Pilate. And so this was written by uh, Tacitus in his annals. And I give, the, I give the reference there. The last one that I'll mention is Pliny the Younger, who also wrote about Christians and how it was, it was difficult to get them in line. So what, what, what they wanted to do in this government was to force Christians to... Uh, renounce their faith 
but they were persecuting the Christians and they just weren't doing it. So he was kind of, these are communications about um, from Pliny the Younger to, um, to some of his superiors and uh, advice or seeking advice or tactics to be able to better persecute the Christians so that they would finally renounce their faith, but they wouldn't. And so in, in those writings, he does discuss Jesus. And so these are, these are extra biblical texts. So one of the, to that argument is that, well, the Bible is really the only thing that actually talks about Jesus. And so, you know, did he really even exist? We have numerous accounts of Jesus' existence, numerous accounts from, recent, from those recent times, very close to when he was living, that are writing about him in, his, in, in the historical accounts. So the idea that Jesus didn't exist is generally looked at as uh, kind of silly by most historians that, that look at this type of history. The next argument is Jesus did not really resurrect from the dead. It was a trick or a grave robbery. So this is probably the biggest argument that you're going to see if you try to um, share the gospel with somebody and they are hostile to this idea um, or, or they're just questioning. This is a very common argument. And this seems to be one that I found Christians to be particularly bothered with, although it's not a new argument. This is actually an argument that's found in Matthew. So we'll look at that in just a moment. So advocates of this, be, this view uh, may state that uh, the disciples somehow concealed his body. And so we can look at uh, Matthew 28, through 11 through 15. We'll look at that in a second. But this, this narrative about Jesus being just sort of hidden like um, how some, somehow the disciples maybe tricked or overtook the Roman soldiers and then somehow rolled the stone over and then got in there, grabbed his body and put it elsewhere um, uh, is, is, a, is kind of the narrative that's concocted. But this is the exact same narrative that the Jewish authorities were giving in Matthew 28. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 28 The word of God says, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And then, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Then in verse 14, and if this comes to your governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And of course, it persists yet even today, is that Jesus was just sort of taken away and he did not resurrect from the dead. And so in this plot, we we see the same thing. So there are several issues that arise with this theory um, into the next slide. So the idea that somebody would dare to attempt to steal bodies uh, from a, a grave, under, especially under the surveillance of Roman soldiers, is, is, is pretty um, improbable. So we have a bit of historical evidence that is a tablet known as the Nazareth inscription from the first century AD that indicates that grave robbers face severe consequences, including death. So I've included a bit of a description here. It's, uh, it's engraved in Greek and contains a decree from an, an, an unidentified Caesar And this decree mandates the imposition of capital punishment on individuals found guilty of desecrating graves or tombs. And so scholars date this around the time of um, of Jesus of the first century AD. So in this, uh, the next slide, so the disciples themselves would have been implicated in this scheme. The problem with this theory is that if what you have to consider And the way to respond to this type of skepticism is you have to consider this. Why would anybody die for a lie? So you have to consider that almost all of these individuals were killed for their faith and their belief in Christ and for the ministry that they they undertook for Jesus. And so these, and not to mention that, virtually all of the people coming just after the ministry of Jesus that followed him were severely persecuted, thinking about the, the persecution of Saul, who later we know as Paul, the writer of many of the Bibles in the New Testament, or many of the books of the New Testament. This theory also fails to take into account 1 Corinthians 15, 6. So let's read that really quick. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says, then he, he talking about Jesus um, being resurrected from the dead after the third day, 
Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So at that time, they were talking about some of their brothers in Christ that had, had passed away, uh, but most of whom were still alive to give their account. And so this argument falls flat. We, we say that what we would say is a logical fallacy, this argument falls on its own sword, is that because this argument this argument assumes information, information is not available that we know that we have. Which that there are more than, more than 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses at that time that saw Jesus uh, resurrected from the dead. We also have evidence that suggests that the ability of these individuals not being influential government, you know, uh, sort of uh, high authority individuals would have been very unlikely to have the power or the, even the ability to overtake Roman soldiers by themselves and then somehow um, skirt Jesus off from there uh, is, is highly improbable. And so highlighting this, highlighting this problem is important. And so I've come to my conclusion as I've given you guys quite a bit of information. We have really three arguments that mostly come against Christians when we attempt to share Christ or when we may, may just be confronted even when we're not sharing Christ if someone finds out that you're a Christian. Um, and this can be especially helpful for our students, that, um, some of you that are in college or going to college, um, to be able to face some of these. I know that when I went to Iowa, it was kind of a shock. Um, I had just come out of Bible college, so like at Christ for the Nations, to give you an example, the dorms for the men and the women are totally separate. There are, there's a very strict dress code. Um, so, you, like, you can't fraternize with, so the males, we, can't, we couldn't fraternize with the females after a certain time of night. If you were found with one of, the, one of your fellow students on campus, you would be, you would get in big, you just didn't want to do that. It was bad news. And, and so, you know, every morning I'm waking up, I'm going to worship right away, like eight, eight o'clock in the morning to go to worship, you had to be in dress slacks, a dress shirt, you had to have a belt on, and you had to have dress shoes. Um, and so, you know, I came from that environment, and then I go to the University of Iowa, and like I'm walking to class, and I see a guy running out in his underwear, and this girl in like a bikini, and I'm going, okay, here I go. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit different. And I remember I had to take, we all had to take a class. Uh, it was called um, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam was the name of the class. And um, it was very interesting to me because the guy that taught the Christianity class, I found him, um, he was sitting in on the lecture for the Judaism portion, and he was reading the Pentateuch, which is the first uh, five books of the Bible in Hebrew, um, and you can buy it in a version that actually uh, gives the English translation of it. It's something like the New King, ja or King James, sort of. And so he's sitting there, and I go and talk to this guy, and I say, hey, you know, it's really neat. You're, you're reading the Pentateuch, and I had just literally read that same text he was using in, in uh, Christ for the Nations. I'm asking him, you know, it's really interesting you're reading the Pentateuch. Um, are you a believer? And he's like, no. <laughs> um, so the guy that taught the class on Christianity was an atheist. So it was very interesting. Um, but the guys, both of the guys that taught Judaism and Islam were both the guy was actually an Orthodox Jew, and the other guy was actually a Muslim. So very interesting that the Christian was, you know, was false, but then the Christian class didn't have a Christian teacher, but um, the other two classes got their representation. Anyway, it's the idea that if you're going to college, you're, you're in college, you're probably going to be faced with some of these arguments. Um, we all will be in any way, but in particular uh, in higher education today, uh, these, these, types of, these types of questions and skepticism are quite abundant. So it'd be helpful for you to study these things. As I told you last week, I've given you information. I hope you will study this. Prepare yourself to share the gospel. Prepare yourself. Now, you might say, well, we just need the Bible to share the gospel. You're right. You're right. That you, got the good, you have the good news right there. However, you're going to need to give an answer for your faith at some point. So prepare yourself for that. Prepare yourself to be able to have that discussion. And so we've talked about these three major arguments that Jesus didn't exist that the resurrection was a hoax, and that Jesus was just a good teacher. And so the, the answers I've given you today have amounted to evidence showing that there is ample extra-biblical evidence from multiple sources that Jesus, in fact, did exist. So this is, again, really a historical fact that really isn't questioned by most historians at all. 
there is a large body of evidence, including 500 witnesses at the time of Jesus' uh, resurrection that confirm, um, not to mention the improbability of the theory that his body was just sort of stolen. Uh, the Roman soldiers wouldn't have wanted, wanted to be saddled with uh, that type of problem. And they were, and the religious authorities gave them an out to say, you know, it was stolen. Last, Jesus never just claimed to be a good teacher. Jesus never claimed that he was just simply speaking in moral platitudes. Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be the Savior, the, the coming Messiah, the promised Messiah. Jesus claimed to be one with the Father. He claimed that if you saw him, you saw the Father. And he claimed that he was perfectly sinless. So we cannot conclude that he was just a good teacher. So what can we do with this information? What can we do with these ideas? And that goes to my last slide, which is share the good news. If you had, if you had the cure for some well-known disease that we know today is plaguing, our, plaguing humanity, cancer is an easy, is an easy, an easy one to think of. I think of lupus, some of those diseases, if you had the cure for something like that, wouldn't you tell somebody? You'd be telling people, like, hey, I've got the, I've got the cure for this. Like, we need to help people with this. You would share. You felt, you felt like you had good news before. Uh, my wife knows really well that I'm pretty much the worst keeper of secrets ever. Like, when I've, if I've gotten her something, I just, like, it's on my face. I'm, like, snickering, and, like, I can't wait to tell her, and I'm, like, not very good at keeping the secret. Um, in fact, she's not here, so I've, I've actually got like a really big surprise for her for our anniversary this year. But um, like, I don't know how to shut up and like not say it because I keep wanting to tell her. Like, I actually think I already, I think I actually already told her. So she's gonna figure it out. She's like really, really good at figuring out secrets. Like, if I have like gotten her something, she's like, she's very intuitive, and um, I can't wait to tell her. Do you feel that way about the gospel? I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself. Do you feel that way about the gospel? Do you feel the urgency to share? I feel the urgency to share when I have something special for my wife. We have something special for humanity. We have the best news, the greatest news ever. It's not just the good news. It's the best news. So let's share it. Use this information for confidence to help you to understand when humanity gives you skepticism, we can share information. Ultimately, there will be individuals that you will never share enough information to convince them. Um, and and, and this, this information shouldn't necessarily be shared to convince, but simply to give an answer. And then people have to do that work for themselves. Christ is going to work in that person individually, like he did in each and every one of us. But let's give that opportunity. And so that, with that, I'll conclude. I'll ask uh, the worship team to come back, come on up if there's a, I think there's a last song. And we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we are humbled being in your presence. We live in a world that is so lost, it's as lost as it was before, and sometimes it feels like things are getting out of control, and we're not sure what to do. Uh, life can be overwhelming at times, and we have so many cares. And sometimes we can lose sight of the great task that we have before us, which is to share the gospel with this world. And so, Lord, I would, help, I would ask for you to help me and help everyone in this room that knows you to continue to share the gospel. In those times when we are not confident, in those times when we're not sure of ourselves, when we may not feel like we have the words to speak, your word says that you will give us those words to speak, to answer. And God, I pray for all my brothers and sisters in the room and myself that you would, um, you, would, you would give us those words, that you would be the source of truth for us and you would help us to find those answers and to have discussions with individuals to help lead them to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.